Good morning, everybody. And well, to today I want to talk to you about configuration and system management, as you can see there. And in particular, I want to talk to you about what you should consider when you actually use tools that do that for you. But let, first, let me introduce myself. As already introduced, I'm Markus Holtermann. I'm a Django Core developer, and I am a computer science master student. Or more pre precisely, I was a computer science master student. I graduated a few months back. And this is actually how I came to give this, or came to the title of this um, talk, and actually give this presentation. Because this is something I, uh, I wrote my thesis about. And back then, I was working at Flying Circus that do operations as a service, so provide you with the maintain the serv servers for you, and you can only uh, only have to maintain what you ne really want to care about, for example, your web applica application. So the c title of my thesis is this, Evaluating Methods to Maintain System Stability and Security When Reversing Changes Made by Configuration and System Management Tools in Unix Environments. <laughs> Bam. OK, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I explain that in a bit during my talk. OK, let's get started. Couple of questions beforehand. Who of you maintains one or more servers? Yeah, that's what I expected. Who of you uses configuration management? Wow, well, even more. Lucky. <laughs> Who of you has a backup restore plan? Wow, that's way more. Uh, for those of you who have, good. For those of you who don't, good luck. And for the sake of your health, uh, get into it, please. OK, let me start off with a question targeting an event in recent history back in 2012. How long do you think uh, it takes until a 400 million com US dollar company with $20 billion daily trades gets bankrupt? More than a week? Hours. Hours, something more, less? 45 minutes. Yes, that's what I uh, thought when I read this, the paper or the uh, article also for my thesis. Okay, let's start off. Configuration management. Um, we bas sorry for that. For the next couple of slides, they are more theoretical, but well, um, I'm gonna get a practical example in the end. Classification of configuration management. Um, when you look at the history of configuration management, you see that in the very very beginning you don't have configuration management at all, which is no configuration management at all. This means that eventually, if you have more than one server doing, your, doing work for you, and all should be the same doing the same thing, you end up with so-called snow, snowflakes. And how you manage to get those weird things is you connect to each host manually and do what you need to do. And because you forget something on one host, you do it afterwards, but then everything blows up at some point. The main thing is you do many change, ma changes manually, which is fine if, you, if it's your private server and you don't really care what if it's going down for a couple of hours. But if you run an environment, environment you have to care about and it provides service to your clients, well, you don't want to do that. Well, then you have um, a more precise or more defined con kind of configuration management. And it was defined by uh, two people, in, by Stephen Trogott and Lance Brown in 2002, so quite a while ago, which means divergent configuration management. And what it means is that you want to have a state, which is the target state you see here, and by still doing many things manually or not in a way that are reliable and consistent, you actually end up at some point, which is totally different from what you want to have. Which in particular, if you combine that with multiple servers, makes this gap even larger. So a way that you can, if you don't use configuration management right now, but you want to get into it, is con so-called convergent configuration management. Which means that you still have the way how your server should look like, but piece by piece, you go ahead, use whatever configuration management tool you want to use, be it Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, whatsoever. 
and you take component by component and mo migrate it over to configuration management, which makes at least these resources or these components reliable once, you, once your server crashes and you have to set it up again. Well, the, this is the thing that many companies do when they m migrate over, but well, it's certainly not the way you want to end up with in the end. So what you want to have basically is congruent configuration management. And as you can see here, they, there's still a bit gap between those two lines, but what you do have there is a reliable system, which means when, I, when you take a new server and deploy your, for example, Ansible playbook on it, well, it's the way it's on all the other servers as well. And the actual state follows the target state. Okay, now that we know what actually configuration management or congruent configuration management, convergent configuration management is, we actually can think about what we need to care about in our IT environment to put into configuration management. And these resources I classified during my, my thesis in, an, in seven categories or um, that I want to go run through in the next slides, which first defines so-called accessibility. So if you have resources that should be usable in every way you have, or you can ima imagine by every user on the service or on the server, well, then they are unres unrestricted. If you have for resources that can only read by, by certain people and only managed by, for example, administrators, well, they are restricted. That's pretty straightforward there. You have the availability or the capacity, which means you have resources that are limited. For example, IPv4 addresses. Well, IPv6 is also limited, but in a much larger scale. CPU computation time, if you have a host node and run whatever container or virtual, uh, virtualization on top of it, well, you can put as many VMs on top of it, but at some point, the co just computation power just doesn't, isn't there anymore. So at some point, it's limited. On the other hand, TLS keys or certificates and private keys and what you can think of in that area are not really limited. You can generate a new one. And as we all know, numbers don't run out. Then we have changeability, which is a bit more complicated um, to think of or to, to get straight. And online changeability I define as the way that if you change it, it doesn't really matter to all the other components in your system, only to this particular component that it's involved in. But for, or for example, if you change, I know I'm on a Python conference, if you change a PHP file, um, it's the next request already automatically gets this new file. And as writing is on the hard disk is more or less atomic, well, this is online and you save and the next, all the next requests get a new file. Offline, for example, means you have to reboot the entire machine, for example. So this happens after a kernel update, for example. Well, there are things like case files that are coming up in new kernel, Linux kernels, but not sure if you really want to go that way. And then there's system runtime, which is something that is really complicated to be aware of and to get right when you use configuration management. Imagine you update or need to restart or update your Postgres database. Your web application or your other application that accesses it would have to hold all the requests and until the database is up again. And at some point, this is all those dependencies to, um, to get straight is really, really hard. And this means that if you need to restart parts of your system, pretty uh, better make sure that you know what is really depending on it. There's identity. If you work in a huge company, you probably don't have just your ETC password user database. You probably have your Kerberos or whatever add up your directory where you authenticate against. And those information might not even ca come out of this, um, this directory. It might even come from your empl employment database so that every new um, um, employee is automatically moved into there or put into this directory. And this is meant to be identity 
um, oh, sorry. Um, identity means something totally different. Um, this is a, the next slide. I uh, messed up my speaker a lot here. Identity, um, identity means if you have a IP for version 4 address, for, for example, it gives an identity to, an, to a service or to a computer. If you have a TLS a certificate, it's an identity. You have something that identifies this. A CPU or software is not identifying or and it's thus um, identity free. Um, that's what I talked about before policy. Um, if you have your employment data database, you might have the data for your employees does not come from, originally come from the uh, uh, LDAP, but it comes from your employment database, which means it's regulated. If it's not regulated, well, it's free. Um, or the other cases when you just have your LDAP directory, for example. Okay, now we get to the uh, recoverability of resources, which is pretty interesting. When you use configuration management, which files do you think you can recover with configuration management? Well, it's mostly only the files that are actually part of your configuration management tool. So configuration files, for example. When you install a program via the configuration management tool and say this program state present, well, you rely on the package manager to not mess up some of the versions and the distributor to m don't change packets in the past. And well, this is recoverable, I call it by program. And then there is unrecoverable data, which is, for example, user data you don't back up. So if you have users in a, a volume in your user homes that you tell users to that it's not backed up and they can put stuff in there, but it's gone, m might be gone at some point. Well, this is unrecoverable data, beta, unrecoverable data and users should not rely on it. Last but not least, there's so-called reversibility. And this is of particular interest to my thesis. Um, this is data you, when you have a change in your configuration management and want to undo it because you messed something up, you might not even be po able to do it in a, um, in a straightforward way. Imagine you have to install a program on a Debian system. Its new state is installed. Once you remove it, it's uninstalled or whatever it is, use Debian or Ubuntu too, too long ago, but it's not never been installed as it was before, which is a totally different state. And depending on how you configured your package manager, if this might be a dependency, you, you would have to acknowledge to be installed in a later time. And because you have installed it before, it might automatically be installed again. So this is something which is really not that easy to get right in terms of configuration management. So when looking at all those classifications, this was a huge time to get this, this beautiful. Um, yeah, this is um, also, um, yeah, this is basically all the classification of, IT, uh, of things I could think of that you might have in your IT environment. If you take whatever resource you can think of, you should be able to get, a, get either of the, uh, at least one of the um, outer circles for every category for your uh, for your resource and that way you should be able to um, follow some guidelines or some rules I'm gonna show you in a bit so I'm not going to go to all the rules I came up with because that were too many so I am gonna give you an example in a, in a second but to understand what's going on there I just pick three or four rules so don't wonder that uh, they are not synchronously. Rule three, for example, is stated, estimate downtime and check dependencies. What it means is basically referring back to what I said before on this slide about changeability. If you have a service that runs at some point and you have dependencies on that, well, you better make sure that all the dependencies are 
up to date and are aware of your, for example, restart. There is no rule six, use environment-wide unique identifiers. That's the thing, identity providing or identity, identity establishing. Um, in order to prevent possible problems with clashing identifiers at some point, make sure identifiers are unique throughout your entire environment. This means, to the example coming up, make sure you don't reuse IP addresses anywhere. Rule 7, re um, review depending resources. Also comes back to what I said about um, online offline restart. When removing resources, all resources that depend on it, what do you do with them? Well, you either remove them as well or you assign them somewhere else. If you don't consider that, well, the behavior in Django in this regards is, for example, if you have a foreign key and don't say on delete, don't delete it, set it to null or something else, well, the data will be deleted. That's a regular thing in databases um, if you don't take care of that. And rule nine, um, prune files and folders with package manager or with configuration management to make sure that once you had a file on the system and you don't need it anymore because it's the service that used it is not there anymore, make sure you remo remove it because otherwise, once you install the service again, it might just pick up this configuration and something might happen. So as an example, um, I came up with a thing that more or less hap regularly happens at the company of, at Flying Circus. And what we, as said, what we do is we provide virtual machines for, class, for clients. And well, an IP address gets assigned to the VM once it's set up and a customer can at some point cancel the contract and the VM is shut down. Pretty straightforward. Then the IP address gets back into the pool where we can take out of, um, the IP addresses to assign it to new uh, VMs and we do, do that with this, with this ad address to a new VM. Fair enough. Uh, but then, f based on some um, rules we have in the, uh, on contracts with the clients, a cu um, client may come back with the, um, with the um, task to, okay, oh, I missed something in my, on my server and need to get this data. Uh, can you start it up again so I can get, to my, get my data? Fair enough, we start up the VM and mm. we have duplicate uses of this particular IP address because we assigned it to another VM already. So that's not too good. So what you have to do is what I said before, make sure you don't reuse identifying resources, even if they are not in use right now, but they, well, they are still in use inside the backup. So what you could that could do the, uh, what you could do there is to put a for example scale the um, assignment of this ad address to new uh, to new VMs at a later point. Coming back to the ex introduction from before, what happened there? Well, it was an American trading company back in 2012. Um, which was more or less um, the, the, yeah, the most um, important trading company back then. And they deployed a, deployed a new software on their servers. Um, and this software was supposed to split large transactions into smaller ones. And once it's done and send all the smaller transactions out on the market, get, uh, send up an update upwards, well, I did that. Well, what happened? One administrator forgot to deploy code on one machine and they reused some flag that disabled some dead code, or disabled some code on this particular machine, so it was more or less dead code, and they reused the flag in the new code, in the new software, and activated, through activating that flag, the dead code already, or again. So, pretty messed up situation. Um, turns out the old server, the, the old version, didn't send the updates up, so it's tried to split the transaction over and over again, of course, selling all the shares over and over again. How to prevent it? Use configuration and deployment technologies to 
deployed co code for you. Automate as much as possible as you can. Not necessarily from now to then in one second. Do it step by step, but do it, please. And, well, checklists are not necessarily deployment tools because, well, you go through them one item by, by item, and that's what they did. And apparently they forgot, uh, the one administrator forgot to check one item on this list. So automate and keep track of dependencies because if they would have done that, they would have seen that this particular service or server is not up to date and wouldn't have restarted the entire system on Monday morning. Thank you. There's my thesis. This is the company I was working for. Much of the code we do there is open source, so many, many of the management code is open source. And yeah, thanks for Flying Circus for part of sponsoring my, my attendance here. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, do we have any questions? Oh, yep. Thanks for that. How would you uh, start moving to configuration management if your current setup doesn't include it? Just get started and do it somehow. So I did it with my servers and I practically took, well, I used Ansible um, and started, okay, let's just make sure I put all the virtual host configuration for my Nginx in configuration management. Then, okay, I have a Django application running here, so just make sure I install Python system-wide and then create virtual environment here and get all those things just step by step. I need a Postgres database. Well, make a role for Postgres to install Postgres, put the conflict in there, and one, one component at a time, and once you realize, okay, I need to change something, well, do that via configuration management. Um, just a question regarding uh, IPs and reuse of IPs. Yes. Yeah, generally, uh, your pool of IPs is sort of finite, so how can, uh, well, uh, unless of course, you know, uh, you establish a new VLAN every every time you want to um, bring up a new uh, VM. Uh, I, so how, how do you sort of propose that that is managed? Um, so what we are doing nowadays at Flying Circus is to, we have a few stages in which we when we, when we delete a virtual machine, it not, not only it's um, deleting it from the, from the management and also deleting the storage and all this stuff, um, we have certain stages in which we know that we have services that run every this interval and once we know this service has been run, we know this backup is gone and we can reuse the IP address again. So what I pro should, uh, would propose as well is um, have a pool of uh, uh, your addresses. Last recently, uh, order them by, um, by re uh, recent usage and use the addresses that are most, um, hasn't been used for the, mo the longest time. Or if you have some that haven't been used at all, use those. If you don't have any of those, maybe also depend on, on how the customers, uh, the custo prior customer behavior and gets, yeah, just be imaginative um, about how you figure out which customer is probably not going to get make me restore the VM. Okay. There's there's no fixed solution, and if you do, if you don't have uh, unused IP addresses, take this one. It's I don't think there's a there's a final solution for that. Yeah, IP version six is. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of the, uh, it's one of the things that we come across. Um, quite regularly, and uh, I think it's very difficult to actually um, deterministically say that you mustn't reuse that. Yeah. Uh, it unfortunately happens. Uh, I think it's. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, that, so, so in saying that, yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah. 
So I think um, uh, there are a few things in configuration management where it's very difficult to say that, um, you know, archiving that to the side is going to be a, a ongoing solution. Um, I agree, and this is mostly, a, this should be the way how you do it. Um, of course, it's in this part area, it's theory and practice, and well, it's, um, if you can get, um, get um, if you can do it the way I propose, I think that's the safest way. If you come close to it, it's still safe. If this doesn't work at all for you because you have as many IP addresses as you have cli uh, customers, well, you already have different problems. Yeah, no. idealistically, it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Any other questions? Um, what do you think about uh, these new ideas about, say, a Phoenix uh, approach to infrastructure where you just kind of um, you have immutable infrastructure and when you want to change something, you actually just get rid of the old thing and ins well, deploy a whole new VM or something? Well, that's, that's the point. It doesn't really help at all. Um, if you have immutable systems, Docker or whatever you come up with there, where do you run this system on? It's immutable. It's mutable system. Uh, it's mutable system below that. So you still have a system where you have mutability, and well, you can move that to a cloud provider and let him worry about that. Well, no, I can't because I have some security restrictions, for example, and or it's my business model to not do that and do it my own. So containerizing or immutable systems might be solutions for certain problems, but they, I don't think they are solutions for all the, all the problems that occur in configuration management. Yeah, my question is, couldn't you resolve the issue with identifiability by using uh, DNS, for example, instead of IP? Well, you still have, might have to configure fixed IP addresses somewhere. Yeah, you would map them in your DNS service. And, and you would yep. ask the client to use names everywhere. His cloud software is terrible and doesn't allow you to DNS. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, DNS. How do you, so let's say a customer comes and wants his own virtual network, uh, via, uh, VLAN, and wants his own DNS inside there. And then you use this as an, uh, this is master and our hidden master DNA, uh, DNS server. That's fine, but how are you going to manage all the addresses in there? It's, it's, you shift the problem somewhere else. It's, it's still a problem. Yeah. Uh, one more question regarding the, when you change, for example, your template for configuration management, how, how would you, how would you prevent uh, introducing new bugs by, I don't know, doing regression testing or having a staging environment or would, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be easier, for example, to like uh, a colleague before me asked uh, to have a one immutable image and, and uh, apply the whole configuration from scratch instead of, I don't know, removing a package? Um, might be, but it's still, you still rely on the configuration management tools and the way, let's say, all of them work is by inspecting what you currently have and what should currently be there and do what's needed to make it the way it, it's supposed to be. And there, have been a, there was an interesting bug in years ago, I think in Red Hat, where you could install two packages, one way or the other, one way worked, the other one didn't because of something I really didn't understand what happened, what was going on there. And well, you could make this, or you could run into this bug in even with configuration management, but if you deploy it on a container, well, it, this particular installation might not work. You deploy it again and it works again. So it's trade off in, it might solve problems, but it might not. Um, the most interesting problems in configuration management typically come from 
mapping the dependencies, which you highlighted on one of your slides as well. Um, the thing that ticked my brain there is like, try to get estimates for the associated downtime for refreshing a particular piece in your overall infrastructure. Um, are you aware of any tools that help capturing those estimates and then probably even mapping them out against other dependencies in the chain if you roll out more comprehensive changes across your infrastructure? If we offer a tools for that? Yeah. No, no. Thanks. It's more like, a, okay, we, we know what's going on there and we, we, when we update, for example, Postgres, we know, okay, it's, we have that many data in that. In this case, it's more like experience. Okay, we know what's going on there. And so we track, that, we track that in the tickets, right, to, in order to do the estimates around that. But it would be, I think it's, and I might take that as an inspiration for some sort of tool or whatever, um, to track the outage time for a dependency chain and then highlight that there's other components going on in order to increase the size of the change window okay. or something like that that is required in order to map it out. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But if you'd um, like, tell me, thank Marcus again.